Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, sorry for the delay. We had our work session that ran up to the hour, and um, but we are uh, council is ready. We'll call the meeting to order for our November fourth edition of the Lexington City Council meeting. Uh, first item of business: If you all stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you all very much. Probably in the past uh, five years that I'm aware of, uh, I've offered a proclamation establishing um, November 1st as the Extra Mile Day in Lexington, and 2021 is no different. Uh, and I'd like to present this uh, to you all. Whereas Lexington, Virginia is a community which acknowledges that a special vibrancy exists within the entire community when its individual citizens collectively go the extra mile in personal effort, volunteerism, and service. And whereas Lexington, Virginia is a community which encourages its citizens to maximize their personal contribution to the community by giving of themselves wholeheartedly with the total effort, commitment, and conviction to their individual ambitions, family, friends, and community. And whereas Lexington, Virginia is a community which chooses to shine a light on and celebrate individuals and organizations within its community who go the extra mile in order to make a difference and lift up fellow members of their community. And whereas Lexington, Virginia acknowledges the mission of the Extra Mile America to create 550 Extra Mile cities in America and is proud to support Extra Mile Day on November 1st, 2022. Now, therefore, I do hereby proclaim November 1st, 2021 to be Extra Mile Day. And I urge each individual in the community to take time on this day to not only go the extra mile in his or her own life, but to also acknowledge all those who are inspirational in their efforts and commitment to make their organizations, families, community, country, and world a better place. Adopted this fourth day of November 2021. Um, and as I look out and see the first responders, uh, leadership uh, chiefs in our um, city, it's not lost on me the extra mile that you all go every day and that your teams go. So thank you all for the work that you do and um, uh, excited to uh, have this proclamation and remind all of council who also goes the extra mile and uh, is an example for everyone in our community. So thank you all very much. Uh, the next item on our agenda is, uh, item is presentations. And I'd like to call on uh, Eric Wilson for a minute in history. Welcome, Eric. Got to go. Red is on. How are we doing there? Good evening. Um, when I spoke with the mayor um, about a month ago to fix on this date, I looked at the calendar and I thought maybe we'll do something about the history of elections. And then I thought better of it. Figured we'd move on to something else. So um, talk about history and sports um, a little bit. Um, and maybe ways of connecting some things, not just about sports and trophy cases, the excitement of them, but how do we understand uh, as a community, as city leadership and schools, as coaches and families, the relationship between education, athletics, community experience, and community memory? What stories can athletics help us tell to help us think about ourselves. So sometimes these history minutes are more about tidbits, little facts and, and things we can learn. Sometimes they're more thematic about a theme. This is very much in that um, sense. Sometimes more a mirror up to ourselves to think about ourselves individually or a microscope on some social patterns. And they're always aiming in some way to be about a spirit of engagement that you as council, that we as citizens can think about some point of connection to the past that activates our present energies. Uh, I grew up loving sports. I still do love them. I don't play them as much. Uh, but I've been watching a lot. There are a lot of community history programs around, museum exhibits uh, that focus in on this arena. 
Um, I think they work in many ways because uh, athletics have engaged many of us and engaged us differently over time, whether as spectators or participants, as parents, as coaches, or as administrative leaders. There's, of course, the excitement of competition, community pride, and tradition, but whatever the scoreline, I think teamwork is always the chorus that rings through, I'm thinking about teammates, mentors, goals, and resilience. Each of us um, in our different positions can think about a specifically valued teammate or coach we've had in the past, however, we define team athletically or otherwise. Um, I always ask uh, Lilburn Downing eighth graders to write about some version of this, and it's often the thing they will most quickly write about. Um, they're ready to do it. Um, and you can use that idea as a portal into other things that they recognize they're doing, but you know, they'll go for you know, their soccer team, their dance team, their theater troupe. Uh, many of these experiences are tied to schools, uh, not all of them, and so I think um, as a city and again as school communities and RARO and athletic groups thinking about the venues, the sites, the occasions, and the media through which we can tell those stories is something a historical society can provide. Uh, we can talk about these further, I can send some of these out, but just a couple things that I've been thinking on, researching, writing about lately, uh, many of you will have seen RHS email that went out recently about Stanley Land, uh, who was a student at Downing, an alum at Rockbridge High, the first black scholarship athlete at the University of Virginia, all ACC, drafted by the Houston Oilers, tasked with char uh, trying to tackle Earl Campbell. And some of you will know that, that is no easy thing. Um, a particular interesting point about his story here is to recognize that his own educational accomplishments for getting a BS in education at the Curry School and, and graduate school courses while coaching there, also come from a long line of teachers. Uh, his great grandfather was the first black, te one of the first black teachers in Rockbridge County after emancipation. Um, great uncle taught over there and his cousin, Margaret Walker, served this school and this community for many, many years and, and known uh, to many and dearly so. Um, so when I talk to, um, students or, or community members, being able to bridge that educational component with the, the excitement is important. Um, and hopefully we'll, we'll have him back here in some way, shape or form to meet with our students. Um, the 1988 Lexington High School football team. You got any people who followed that team at that time around here? They were state champs. They were kind of an underdog late run team. It's a team that I've found catches a lot of attention. Um, here and at our historical society, we're custodians of stewards of many of the objects that are kept. Um, sometimes these are kept, you know, we have some there, sometimes they go away when buildings are consolidated or renovated, moved. How to figure what kinds of things, material objects to feature or what media stories to share, I think is something we would like to be in conversation with different groups, whether school boards or city, and to think how that might be. Um, and lastly, uh, a name also known to many of you, Lewis Watts, um, who was born here, um, one of the most, I think, notable models um, as a student, as an athlete in the school, born in 1935. He was a soccer star, high jumper, track athlete. He was the record-breaking kicker on the football team. Um, and I think that football team won high school titles in both 51 and 1952. He was a pitcher on the softball team, threw two no-hitters, uh, and he did this um, in spite of being born without arms. Uh, there's a picture um, in San Diego. There's a, a National Enquirer profile. This is before the National Enquirer was like doing Elvis in the supermarket. Uh, and the, the picture that most strikes me is him uh, writing uh, on the school, on the chalkboard. I have trouble enough writing on a chalkboard without breaking it. This cursive is impeccable. Um, and to do that with his right foot, um, he was a newsboy. I mean, just the resilience that he showed. Again, this is a student, this is a story that students can hear and move from disabilities to different abilities and think about how that happens. And to know that the field behind their school is Watts Field. Um, and that that is part of a place um, that they have some connection to. 
and what they might be mindful of and how we might honor that or return that. So um, at a student level, at a community level, I hope we can continue to find appropriate, meaningful ways um, you know, uh, to acknowledge these traditions because they're so collective, uh, because they're so vitally tied to teams. It's a very interesting project in Charlottesville, uh, Admiral County Historical Society that's looking at desegregation of Central Virginia Public High School athletics. One way of taking that within certain set of social concerns, um, and uh, but uh, plenty of others ahead. So I, I run on a bit with great enthusiasm for the topic, um, but thank you for your leadership. And um, I don't think I'll talk about elections at the next time either, but sometime we'll go back to that. So thanks. Thank you, Eric. Uh, it's always <clears throat> uh, refreshing to think about our history and such positive stories with our history. And uh, as you talk about different teams and coaches, I'm reminded of um, uh, some that are still with us, uh, uh, Coach Brown, who's still active in the community um, and uh, served uh, Lexington High School and in their community for a good 30 plus years. And Coach Madison, who uh, uh, coached with Coach Brubaker, and uh, terrific individuals that were um, meaningful foundations of our community. So it's good to pause and reflect and think about those folks and, and the successes that they contributed to in our community. Uh, next item, speaking of uh, positive contributions to our community, I'd like to uh, invite Dr. Laura Cornegay to the podium for uh, her remarks. Dr. Cornegay, thanks for joining us. If you'll be so kind as to press the button and light up the mic, and you can just leave it on. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you guys so much for having me. We wanted to take a few minutes to do some reflection, similar to the last speaker on the pandemic at about the year and a half mark. It's obviously been a huge emergency response. Um, we've uh, investigated and contact traced over 42,000 cases within our district and have distributed over 172,000 um, vaccines to date. Um, that's not um, been an accomplishment that uh, could have been taken on solely by public health. It required um, all of our community partners to participate and to get us um, to this point, and that included all of our um, localities. So we really wanted to take an opportunity to recognize the contributions that the localities have made, uh, particularly our emergency management folks. Um, they've really been on the front lines of clinics, um, testing. Um, they've been with us um, hand in hand since the beginning. So we wanted to take this opportunity while we have a kind of lull in cases and um, things are looking better. We're, you know, we're blessed to have vaccines that are safe and effective and are going to be able to distribute them to the 5 to 11 year olds um, starting next week in Lexington, but take an opportunity to recognize uh, just tremendous contributions um, of two of our emergency management partners, and that would be um, Trent Roberts and Ty Dickerson. And if they're here, I could come up and get this. Oh, you're welcome. And this is just a, a small token of our appreciation. Obviously, we can't repay them for the countless hours that they've spent um, in, in clinics, organizing, um, just being an integral part of the response. And um, likewise, thank you for the support of Lexington City to all of our efforts as well. Before you step away, if you'll step between, uh, be the rose between those thorns. And Jen, if you want to shoot them. <laughs> Terrific. Thank you very much. A little uh, token of our appreciation for your support and a way to remember us. The lion's share of this step, goes, step on up. For, the lion's share of this goes to Trent. Emergency management is is half of his job, and for the last 20 months, it's consumed about 120 percent of his time. Uh, we gave 14,000 collectively, 14,600 and some shots just at that Peebles Clinic sometimes four days a week for several months. Trent was at every single one of them. Janie took care of getting the information out to the public seven days a week, sometimes at 10 o'clock at night. I'd send her an email, she'd send me a reply. I'd look at the website, she posted it five minutes later. 
really a team effort for a lot of people. Thank you. I would just like to say that I don't like accolades. I was doing what you expect me to do, but on behalf of the fire chief and all my partners in the Emergency Management Task Force, I humbly and gratefully accept this with a special acknowledgement to my personnel, our personnel in the fire department who also assisted with giving shots, vaccines, and working the clinic. So thank you. Thank you, doctor. We appreciate it. Well, of course, that was in addition to uh, responding to fire and EMS calls and um, occasionally uh, life. So we are greatly appreciative of all the commitment and dedication that you all have provided, Dr. Cornegay and the, the whole team responding to this uh, uh, world epidemic and uh, crisis. And um, I think we're a much better community and certainly a much stronger community because of your work and support uh, collectively. So thank you all very, very much. And glad for you to go home and enjoy your families. As, <laughs> but you're welcome to stay if you'd like. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, next item on our agenda, uh, consideration of minutes. You receive those in your packet, and unless there's an objection, we will approve those as presented. Hearing no objections, those uh, minutes are approved. Move right into citizens' remarks and comments. Did not see that anyone had signed up, but is there anyone here tonight who would like to speak to City Council? Seeing no one making an indication, uh, we'll move on from citizens' remarks into a consent agenda and invite you, uh, uh, you receive that uh, information. Request from Rebecca Logan, uh, Main Street Lexington for the street closure for the Jingle Bell Run and would ask for your uh, consideration. I make a motion that we approve the consent agenda as presented. Second. Have a motion and a second. We'll have a um, roll call vote. Ms. Strong. Aye. Mr. Smith. Aye. Mr. Alligood. Aye. Mr. Ayers. Aye. Mr. Sigler. Aye. Ms. Alexander. Aye. A motion carries unanimously. Thank you all very much. Uh, next. Um, pardon me. A uh, quick question um, about what we just approved and. Uh, the, the, the financial impact and the cost are public safety and public works. And this goes to the, the comments that um, Chief Green made last meeting about the cost that public safety has to deal with with these events. And I'm just curious if there's an estimate of what this costs public safety, just this, this event alone. And not to put you on the spot, if you've got a number, great. If you don't, I'd, I'd like to hear it at some point. Um, and if I can add on to that, uh, the, the Jackson Street closure, I'd be very curious as to what that costs annually, and maybe you'd have a better sense of that since we just went through it. Um, no rush, but if, if, you, if you do get some sense of that, if you could share it with City Council, we'd appreciate it. I would say just from a process standpoint, Chief, if you can get with the City Manager and he can uh, distribute that information to us. Um, as you point out, the meeting, um, all of these events that what we do um, come with a, a specific hard dollar cost, whether it be overtime, um, disruption to uh, other services, et cetera. So um, having some sense of that, that we can be aware and, and share. Um, I think we'd had some discussion previously, and maybe it was just um, not, not in the council meeting, but at some point in time in the past, we had talked about uh, drawing a line in the sand and saying any new events, we're going to start charging or, or have, have a fee for those to, to be done. Um, and um, that, that has been implemented, and I'm not sure if it's something council may want to look at or address in the future. Um, I would ask uh, our city attorney to weigh in on that. I think there may be a, a, a First Amendment issue on that to... To, to draw a line like that and, and allow existing events to continue and charge new ones. I could be wrong, but what are your thoughts? I think uh, generally First Amendment issues, you're okay as long as you're content neutral. Um, so I, I wouldn't see sort of the time frame or, you know, certain 
events or organizations being grandfathered in as any sort of content restriction. Um, so, you know, as long as we're not saying one group is, you know, group A can come in and say whatever they like, but group B can't come in and say anything, um, I think we're okay on that. I think this is much more, at least sort of on initial hearing, initial thoughts would be, this is just sort of a, a structural procedural thing that uh, cost recovery has sort of become an issue and now going forward we need to. Um, so as long as we're not tying it to any sort of content or promoting a certain viewpoint, I think we'd be okay. But I'd be happy to take a look before we sort of move any farther on it. Yeah. It's also a circumstance where different events would have different costs. Not every 5K runs in a circle or um, you know, on a trail. When it's on the streets, it's much more expensive closing the streets and, and a lot more personnel. So um, just could be a tool to uh, make things a little bit easier for uh, police and, uh, and fire and rescue as well. So thank you all. Uh, thank you, Chuck, for the question, and um, we'll look forward to those results. Uh, next item on the agenda, uh, reports and uh, communications, Blue Ridge Resource Authority, Mr. Smith. Uh, Blue Bridge Resource Authority meets uh, on Monday. Um, update on some other items that uh, we're working on. Uh, cell two construction. Uh, the liner should be start should start being uh, laid uh, next week. That's when guys come in and start laying down the, the plastic and seam it, um, and uh, so we can collect the, the leachate that we send off to the water treatment facility for for safety concerns, et cetera, and EPA guidelines. Um, the uh, completion on that should be uh, into January and hopefully get a certificate uh, for operation uh, by January, which will coincide pretty closely with when uh, cell two, I'm sorry, cell one uh, fills up. We have not yet heard back from DEQ on the uh, change from full closure to you know, intermediate cover so we can um, save some expenditure and also maybe get a little more lifespan out of cell one uh, as it compacts and uh, finding extra um, airspace to use uh, down the road. Um, we should be, we're, we're getting pretty close to a, a signed contract also for ground water and, um, and gas monitoring um, then hopefully to save some money there as well as we move down the road. Um, and hopefully on Monday we'll have an announcement um, for a new director. That's my report. Any questions? Any questions for Mr. Smith? Hearing none, Main Street Lexington. Ms. Strong. <laughs> We have lots of events coming up. Sorry, Chief. <laughs> uh, we have the Art Walk tomorrow on Gallery Row. That's from 5 to 7 p.m. The Candlelight Processional and Lighting of the Community Christmas Tree on Friday, November 26th. And Love Lex Lotto will run all through the holiday season starting Saturday, September, uh, sorry, September, Saturday, November 27th through December 24th. Small Business Weekend is the weekend after Thanksgiving. That's November 24th. 6th through 28th, and the Lexington Christmas Parade is Friday, December 3rd, and the theme this year is Christmas Classic Movies. And the Jingle Bell Run, as you just heard through the approval, will be Saturday, December 4th. And that's all I have, unless there's any questions. Thank you, Ms. Strawn. Hearing no questions, uh, we'll go to the Planning Commission. Sure. The Planning Commission met on Thursday, October 28th, and we continued drafting an ordinance for small cell facilities. We reviewed our institutional district master plan requirements in anticipation of receiving a request for a master plan amendment from Washington and Lee. We made recommendations for sidewalk improvements as re was requested from Public Works. And on the bike and, ped uh, bike and pedestrian plan, the consultants met with the green infrastructure team and they are scheduling stakeholder meetings as well. And we continue, oh, sorry, we expect the school board to submit an application soon to install outdoor classrooms and shade structures at both Waddell Elementary and Lilburn Downing Middle School. And that's all I have unless there's any questions. Thank you very much. No questions, it appears. Regional Tourism Board, Mr. Ayers. Thank you. Um, Regional Tourism will meet um, 
next on Wednesday, November 17th, uh, but I did have a couple items to mention. Uh, first, we just completed um, some fall photo video shoots featuring many points of interest, including Blue Ridge Parkway, Natural Bridge, Goshen Pass, and of course, downtown Lexington. Um, and uh, last month, Regional Tourism hosted travel writers from Blue Ridge Mountain Travel Guide and Virginia Sportsman Magazine. Uh, a note on the uh, Virginia Tourism's American Recovery Funds program. I'm, I'm guessing that the, the city manager will have more on this, but it turns out that Lexington is eligible for $40,000, Buena Vista $30,000, and Rockbridge $140,000, making total funds available to our region of $210,000. And tourism staff is currently researching projects that might be eligible for and a good fit for this program. Um, Shenandoah Beer Works Trial excuse me, Beer Works Trail, trial, annual, it, it would be if you don't drink beer, I suppose, annual brewery meeting is being hosted at Heliotrope on November 9th. Um, regional Tourism's holiday-themed digital content and Facebook campaigns will launch November 15th. And uh, I mentioned uh, at our last meeting that we received five sponsorship applications for round two of Regional Tourism's sponsorship program. And this covers events occurring between January 1st, 2022 and June 30th, 2022. The program awards up to 3,000 in grants to organizations that partner with tourism on events that bring visitors from outside the region to our community. And we'll shortly be reviewing the five applications submitted by uh, Natural Bridge State Park's Kids Fishing Day, uh, the, the Gravista Bike Race, Maury River Fiddlers Convention, Lime Kiln Theater, and the uh, Rock Ridge Area Health Center's Bull and Oyster Fest. Um, we will be uh, voting on the, uh, the applicants and the award amounts and we'll make decisions at our November 17th meeting. Um, and that's all I have, unless anybody has any questions. Any questions from council? Uh, hearing none, <clears throat> Raro, Mr. Sigler. Uh, the Raro Board of Directors met last night. We uh, have concluded the fall sports seasons. We did a picnic for the coaches uh, for soccer, cheerleading, and football at Jordan's Point uh, recently. Uh, the Super Bowl that I've alluded to previously that happened between Lexington and Buena Vista, that Buena Vista won. Um, one tidbit to share is that it was really neat that Doug Chase actually did the announcing, uh, at, and it was at the Varsity Stadium over at, at Perry McClure, but it was really neat that Doug Chase was able to, to do that and the kids getting their names called out, uh, which is awesome. Um, we're now kicking off basketball, and we have about 375 kids uh, signed up for basketball, which puts us on par with our numbers pre-pandemic. And so our staff is working diligently with all kinds of administrators at the schools uh, to secure gym space. Because as we know, we have a shortage uh, of gyms or just have a, an abundance of teams. And so it requires quite a bit of choreography to figure out who can practice when uh, so that families and kids can get the, the most benefit out of Raro basketball. So really that concludes my report. Thank you, Mr. Ziegler. Any questions <clears throat> regarding Raro? Threshold, Ms. Alexander. Threshold met on Wednesday the 27th, and um, we had a long discussion all leading to what we're going to be discussing um, at the um, scheduled uh, program with the guest speaker on November 17th. We talked about... Um, the State Housing Trust for Virginia has $75 million to spend on affordable housing. Uh, there are 50 state housing programs, and how do you navigate and, and maneuver through that um, for a locality to determine what kind of funding to get, what kind of housing, what kind of program do you want to get involved in? Um, our housing uh, study that was done by the Shepherd Program uh, focused on our neighborhoods, our local neighborhoods, but the Ready Grant is going to focus on the entire community. So look, we look forward to uh, seeing what those results are. And um, we talked a little bit about Threshold's future mission and we know so far that we want to make housing education 
part of that mission, um, educating the public as well as it, in general about housing types of programs, but also credit um, counseling and those kinds of things um, for individuals and, and their families. Um, we do um, have a lot of concern about our mission and the fact that we have a small planning uh, department. So we have to remain cognizant of what we plan to do to make sure it's something that's doable within um, the staff that we have. We know that we need affordable housing, um, elderly housing, market rate housing, solar housing, housing rehab for the current housing stock. Um, accessory dwellings, co uh, cottage housing, a gamut of, of various types of housing uh, needed in the community. So there is a lot to do, but again, uh, we're trying to remain um, conservative in regard to our staffing uh, and the needs of that department. We hope to, um, as far as I know, um, the program is going to be on November 17th, either 5.30 or 6, I'm not sure. 5.30. 5.30? Okay. Because we met on Wednesday, you all met on Thursday, so I didn't know what the decision was. Um, Charlie from Milliner and um, Bob Adams will be participating in that event. And that's all I have. Unless you have questions. Yeah, and I was just going to mention, it will be virtual, so if anyone's interested in listening, they can uh, contact the planning department to get the link. Thank you. Any other questions for Ms. Alexander? Hearing none, uh, Mr. Alligood, uh, Maury Service Authority. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The Maury Service Authority board met uh, this past Tuesday, uh, Tuesday a week previous to this week, and uh, to discuss the uh, urgency of, of matters for the MSA. And one of the items that was a surprise to the board was the estimated cost for replacing the control system for the wastewater backup generator at six hundred thousand dollars instead of the one hundred thousand that's been discussed this uh does not include the generator itself which is deemed to be in good shape it's the control system for it it's, it's uh, amazing how much uh this can cost but the the uh, so when the equipment is ordered is not yet ordered the estimate is that there will be a 10-month delay in uh, receipt of the equipment once the order is placed in there. And so there needs to be a certain amount of engineering done in advance of the order, and that hasn't been done yet, but that is projected to occur soon. The uh, additional discussion uh, is also about the, the uh, projected $20 million modernization cost for the water treatment plant and the uh, uh, MSA staff was directed by the MSA board to uh, present in January at the January meeting of the MSA a, a plan for what needs to come first. It's an implementation plan. What needs to come first, second, third, and so forth in this modernization and the associated costs. So that'll be a big meeting and uh, it'll be a critical meeting as well. And then we're looking forward to getting the engineering report on the wastewater treatment plant, which has not been discussed yet, nor has any dollar value been presented for the modernization of that. And so that's where we stand on the water treatment plant, right on the uh, water, drinking water plant. Mr. Smith, did, did, did I hear you correctly? It's going to be half a million dollars for a, 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 a PLC board for the for, for the emergency generator. Not just a board. It was six hundred thousand was the estimate, uh, which is a good half a million. 
and uh, it'll involve uh, hardware beyond the uh, PLC uh, control system and whatnot. Apparently, the manufacturer, the vendor that the MSA staff is dealing with is Square D, and the description given about the control system for it, it includes the switching, the electrical switching from the mains to the backup generator and as being a big deal as being a very large piece of equipment. I don't expect you to know this answer, but I'm just wondering, uh, do we know how often the emergency generator has been needed over the, you know, I'm sure it's tested regularly, but needed. I just I, I can't give you the number of times that uh, it's been on, but in the description of its use, there has been mentioned several times of the inability to get it to work. That the to actually, it, it's not as simple as pushing a button and starting it up. There has to be because the automatic control system is not working, there has to be a manual uh, switch over for getting off of the mainline power into the backup power, and they've had issues doing that, and in some instances they were unable to do it, and generally when you switch over, you expect things to come up in a matter of minutes in there to do that. And they were talking about maybe a half hour or plus to get those things to come up. Well, as you know, the they only have one plant. We only have one plant, and we can't stand for that plant not to run in there. And so the, the sewer flows, the wastewater flows, going into the plant never stop in there. And this last, if it happens in a big rainfall event, which occurred back in September, uh, they were inundated literally with with the water, and uh, uh, but they didn't need the backup power. Fortunately, at that time, but they're 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 living on the edge, so to speak, with that backup system. And again, the surprise was the the money that has been discussed all along to install this. Uh, automatic control system for the backup generator has been in the neighborhood of $100,000. And surprise, surprise, we're now talking six times that. And that was the same equipment, 100000 versus the 600000 It wasn't that the scope or, or the... Yeah, scope did not change. It's, we're talking about the same function, the same equipment, and now things are getting definitive. And, uh, uh, but the order hasn't been placed yet for the equipment and it has to be, there has to be some engineering design and sizing to make sure it's right. And one of the things that, as it turns out, the wastewater plant doesn't know that'll have to be learned is what the actual loads, electrical loads, are on the equipment when everything is running. Because that's what the backup generator will have to supply. And so there has to be some engineering work to figure out what those exact loads are for that backup generator to uh, cover them. Interesting stuff. Any other questions for Mr. Alligood? Well, thank you for representing us on the MSA. And if there's any um, resolution or uh, work that council can do to support you in your position as you navigate <clears throat> the landscape, please let us know. Thank you, and I think we'll be having a discussion from time to time about this major project. Indeed, thank you. Uh, under my report, I just, uh, one, want to give a big thank you to Janie for um, helping me uh, navigate the boards and commission lists and all the people that volunteer for those. Um, we do have one outstanding application from Len Denicola for the Community Services Board, and I'll be bringing... Um, uh, plan to bring his name forward at our next meeting. Um, and that's all I have to report for this evening. I'll call on the city manager. Mr. Mayor, I'll defer my, or this portion of my report to the finance director, uh, Jennifer Bell, to give an update on the fourth quarter FY21 uh, financials and the first quarter FY22 financials. Thank you, city manager. Good evening, mayor, city council, city attorney, City Clerk, thank you for having me. 
So I am pleased to report that the fourth quarter um, finished very positively with revenue growth. Most local tax categories finished the year ahead of budget and utility revenues have improved significantly from what we had seen earlier in the year. Expenses remained in line with expectations through the end of fiscal year 21. The effects of inflow and infiltration continue to present the only significant budgetary issue for wastewater operations. Overall, fiscal year 2021 finished strong, and I am not recommending any action at this point. Any questions on FY21? Mr. Allegood. Uh, with regard to the I and I, uh, city council had authorized money. I was just wondering to to help reduce the I and I. I was just wondering if we're get, beginning to see any effects of that expenditure in terms of reduced I and I flows. Uh, Mr. Allegood, that project has not started yet. They've just identified the point repairs that are necessary. There was a lot of camera work that had to be done and exploration of every every foot of sewer line. And so there are point uh, repairs that have to be done because they're not uh, in as good a shape as necessary to line those areas. So that's where that is. Actual construction has not started at this time. So clearly we won't yeah, have any, anything, right? any data. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ms. Chaligan. Go right ahead, Jen. All right, so moving <laughs> along to the first quarter in FY22. Um, basically, it's very early in the year. However, the financials do reflect both revenues and expenses that are generally in line with our expectations. And um, I am also not recommending or requesting any action at this time. Steady as she goes. Any questions for Jen on the first quarter? Hearing none, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, uh, Finance Director Bell. Um, on a number of topics, there's always something I'd like to share with the council, and I will note that in planning and zoning updates that October was a, a big month for inspections and enforcement, with 114 inspections performed. Residential inspections number 34, commercial was 21, and there were 52 erosion and sediment control inspections. Despite the number of activities noted, total permit fees collected was only $3,311, which means our businesses and homeowners continue to receive excellent value when they come to city staff for these permits and inspections. You know, as, as taxpayers, they get a pretty good deal there. We're doing a good job for them. Um, something that I'm sure all of you and many citizens are wondering about, we did get four proposals for the Spotswood site that's going to be developed or potentially developed. They were received by the deadline of November 1st, and there was no indication that other proposals were planned but were late. So the only proposals forthcoming that were received were those four. Nobody contacted me and said, oh, by the way, I, didn't, I wasn't able to get here and by the deadline. So my assumption is those were the only four interested parties or four interested proposals. Three of those proposals, however, were received from the Spotswood Collaborative. Uh, so they uh, took the full gamut range of single family housing to uh, townhouses to apartments, and they have a proposal under each category. The fourth proposal came from Echelon, uh, who had all been from the start interested in this, um, this site. So the proposal will be reviewed by the planning staff, finance director, and myself, and I'm anticipating that um, I'll have something to you, a recommendation in January. With the holidays coming up, and we're also starting CIP preparation and budget, believe it or not, and with a new finance director, I'm not going to try and push her too quickly into this um, evaluation of these different proposals. But we have a system that we used last time around. We'll probably just plug those things into it and look at the differences that emerge and then recommend to you what proposal seems best for the city at this juncture. Um, Council Mayor, Member Ayers mentioned the ARPA tourism grants, and there's really nothing more to report uh, than what he noted. Um, I did speak with the tourism director and asked what her input might be or recommendations, and she said she was working on that. So from a standpoint of the city of Lexington anyway, I'm just awaiting to hear from uh, tourism because we need to get advice and you know input from tourism before we do make some decisions there. Uh, it would be 
Uh, I think very advantageous if we looked at it on a regional basis. I've had conversations with the county administrator and city manager in Buena Vista, but obviously without any kind of expectations or recommendations, we can't really come up with any strategy at this juncture. <clears throat> Another project that's ongoing and we have seen progress on is the Diamond Hill Utility, Utility Project. Probably some of you, and I'm sure it's true of um, Councilmember Alexander, see the, the work daily. Uh, most of it is on Massey Street at this time, and it's primarily water line replacement that they're working on. Uh, luckily, and I hate to even mention this, um, they haven't had supply shortages, in, but it's how we've been just a just in time uh, system about every two weeks they get enough supplies for water main that they can keep working so hopefully they don't run into some um, problems with, with delays there um, while the main is being put in at this time the next steps on each main that's put in and which is true here in Massey Street is a pressure test that main make sure it's it holds up then each individual service will be transferred to those mains the new mains so that work is far from over even on Massey Street because each individual customer will have to be hooked into that new water main. So no problems have arisen as far as I know. I guess the contractor has done a pretty good job. The residents have been very understanding and patient. And uh, I hope that continues because with winter, it's not going to get any easier on those streets and they're going to be in a state of disrepair, unfortunately. Uh, updates from the fire department. October, the department conducted 47 community risk reduction activities. And these activities included response to fire code complaints, fire safety presentations, annual business fire code inspections, construction permits, et cetera. So when they're making these uh, inspections or showing up at the businesses and homes, they're trying to make sure that nothing evolves into a problem later on down the line for health and safety. Total calls in October were 324, which is a new monthly record. This past June had previously been the month with the highest calls but now another record month has been seen. Of the calls received, 188 were in Rockbridge County, 107 in Lexington, and 29 in the city of Buena Vista. Last week, the department responded to an accident in West Washington and Jefferson, and notably two pedestrians were struck by a vehicle. Both the mother and child were transported for medical care and luckily had only minor injuries. Uh, so it was, you know, not a, a, a catastrophic, if you will, <laughs> incident where somebody was going too fast or didn't they, um, watch out, they just were bumped, if you will. No. The department, however, with Rockbridge Fire and Rescue in Cars Creek also responded to a vehicle accident on West Midland Trail. As you've seen in the paper, there was a fatality in that um, accident and a serious injury uh, also. The department has experienced one new COVID case that arose while a team member was on vacation. That individual is at home and so are two other firefighters who came in close contact and were then quarantined. With these three members out in a vacancy in the department, the staffing has been tight, but the full-time and part-time staff has kept up with staffing needs by serving on additional shifts. So they, like others, uh, departments are seeing a little bit of problem with staffing, but this, in this case, it's COVID-related primarily. Um, of note, Chief Dickerson, who left us, is celebrating his 12th year with the department. One of the things that was approved by the General Assembly recently was an outdoor refreshment area bill. And outdoor refreshment areas are areas that can be established in specific areas of the community and must be approved by the Virginia Alcohol Beverage Commission. If such an area is established, alcohol can be carried and consumed outdoors on public property. However, it's important to note that these activities are limited to 16 days per year. Each activity that is requested must be approved by City Council and the uh, ABC Commission, and the only entities that can sell alcohol are the licensed establishment in that refreshment area. So if we were to establish a refreshment area in downtown Lexington on Main Street, as an example, only the businesses on Main Street that, have, that were in that area could sell alcohol, and it could then be taken out of their establishment and consumed outside. If you were on Jefferson Street or on Randolph Street or Nelson Street, you're outside of the area at that point because you're not in it and you could not do that. Um, the Main Street Lexington director, uh, Police Chief Green and I are looking at and reviewing the regulations and rules for this district. We're not ready to come before you for any kind of recommendation at this point in time. Again, we have consulted with the Virginia uh, ABC and uh, we may have a recommendation forthcoming to actually establish a district 
without approving any events because each event would be brought before city council, the police chief, the Virginia ABC before the event would actually occur. Uh, the district could be in place for six months and never have an event until one was requested that met the requirements of city council, the ABC and the police department. So we're looking at it very carefully, but it is an option for us to consider. Again, the main street director will, if you will look at those businesses downtown, talk with those businesses, consult with them who might have an interest or who might say, we don't think it's a good idea before we come forth with a recommendation. Some of you may have heard of the Marcus Alert Program. And this was a piece of legislation that also was recently passed. And the intent of it was to be sure that in instances where there was a behavioral or mental health issue and a, an emergency call where the police would show up, that we'd also have mental health workers show up for that call when we, when we're, when we know it's a mental health or a behavioral health situation. In fact, the intent of the legislation is that in many cases, police would not show up at all. They've divided those types of calls into four classifications and you have a, a minor call where maybe it can even just be an online consultation with a mental health provider. You have a more severe, severe or serious call where somebody does have to show up, but it will not be the police. And then you go up from there where the police shows up with the mental health worker and then the police shows up by themselves in the most severe case because the, it's not safe for the mental health worker to be there. So we had an opportunity to sit down with uh, I think three different groups of localities across the state who are already working through the implementation of the process. They're sort of a test case for the whole state. Uh, we had over 750 participants on this conference call, uh, presentation, if you will, including the Rock Ridge County Sheriff, our police department, uh, Bath County Sheriff, Allegheny County Sheriff, city manager from Buena Vista, Buena Vista PD, myself, County Administrator uh, Spencer Suter, because each locality has to put forth a plan, and of course, Community Services Board Director Kim Shaw. Each community has to put forth a plan by July 1 of 2022, how we're going to implement this legislation. And we don't have to do it by ourselves. We can do it as a district. Although no commitments, no decisions have been made, we're exploring what we may be able to do and then bring back to our localities as a recommendation. We don't obviously have a lot of time to put this plan in place. In all probability, what we'll do is look at what some of these other districts have done across the state and sort of cut and paste. Um, the requirements are the same for everyone. The real issue is the resources that are available. How many you know, uh, mental health providers do they have in Allegheny County? How many do they have in Bath County? Um, how quickly can we get those providers throughout our district or our region if there is a regional plan put in place? So those are the kind of questions we have to answer and have to look at, so you'll be seeing some, some quick um, actions on that. One of the things we have to do is put in place uh, an advocacy group, a committee that looks at all the different advocates in that field or in that particular area of concern and to make recommendations on how that plan should unfold, how we should um, implement the, the uh, intent of the act, if you, if you will. So it's going to be very detailed, problematic, may be expensive, uh, you know, it, um, it involves the dispatchers who have to, from the first time the call comes in, have to receive special training to identify the severity of the call. As long as somebody's on the line, they have to remain on the line with that caller until it's resolved. So if there's not enough dispatchers to dispatch, then the other emergency responders, what do we do? You know, we have to have some level of backup. Yeah, it involves the fire department as first responders at certain points. They have to be trained as well in critical incident training. S same thing with any law enforcement officer who responds, they have to have critical incident training. So it's just a plethora of different changes that we'll, uh, we'll be facing. And we may again be looking at that on a regional basis and a lot of questions there, a lot of opportunities to cooperate and collaborate to make sure we get the most effective and efficient system possible, but it's not a simple thing. The good news is, while we have to have a plan in place by July 1, 2022, we don't have to implement it here in our area of the community or the state until 2026. So we can have that plan in place and watch and see how things evolve throughout the state as they implement their plans. Some of the more urban areas are scheduled to implement today, next year, 
and then they'll run it, ramp it up and it'll go throughout the state. So it's a, it's a big deal, unfortunately, and a lot of uh, opportunities there, but a lot of challenges as well. Um, bum, bum, bum. Public works activities. I don't know if you've been down to the skate park, but the public works uh, crews did paint the pavilion there, and it's a real positive look to see it in good shape, and we've had some real good comments, positive comments about it. If you get a chance, go check it out. Uh, the police department conducted a community walk at Points Place on October 26th. Chief Green and her staff met with security camera vendors to determine if cameras could be utilized at both the skate park and a juice adjacent outdoor pool. Uh, as you recall, we've had from time to time people jump in that pool at night, and it'd be nice to be able to prevent that from occurring and make sure that we don't have injuries there or other concerns. Uh, obviously, the skateboard also from time to time, skateboard park that is, has little problems with either graffiti or kids getting a little uh, harassing each other, if you will, a little bit of um, um, taunting and that type of thing going on. It's, it's common to kids, but we want to be able to watch that. Plus, if, um, if we're able to buy a camera or two for that, it actually turns out that a lot of skateboarders like to make sure their tricks are uh, on the social media so all their friends can see it all over the state and family members. And next time their buddy shows up, the buddy's going to outdo that trick they have. So it's a, a way of um, advertising their, their, their expertise on the skate park and getting that out there and sharing that with others. So sort of a fun thing. The Community Foundation has made a $1,500 donation to the skate park. Chief Green also spoke recently to the Women's Club of Lexington and among other items mentioned the ongoing skate park effort. She also mentioned the employee Santa dinner and a number of other department activities to just keep others in the community updated as to what she is doing in the department. And the department is uh, looking at its priorities. Corporal Thomas Moeller attended SWAT training. The department provided road closures again for activities such as the Waddell Elementary School costume parade, security for the downtown trick or treat, and extra patrols on the 31st throughout the city with an emphasis on Jackson Avenue, as we previously mentioned. And the officers continue to spend a number of hours on foot patrol each week throughout the community. The department received a $1,620 grant from the Department of Criminal Justice Services. This funding is intended to use to be strengthened crime control activities in the community. Uh, radar ridership in the community continues to recover with an increase of nearly 44% over last October. Actual trips, however, are still down about 11%. So we've got the ridership moving up and the trips moving up a little, a little more slowly because from time to time I know they've had problems getting drivers as well. So um, prevalent throughout our service area and all of our organizations that we can't find employees as much as we'd like to. And that's my report. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Members of Council, Mr. Ziegler. Uh, Jim, can you explain what... 52 erosion and sediment control inspections by our planning department, what that entails, like what they what a typical erosion and sediment mm -hmm. control sure. inspection in the city right. looks like. It, any land disturbing uh, activity. So if you have a uh, home being built, of course, you're, you're, you know, you're disturbing the, the land there. And even if it's a small home, you still have to do an inspection. If you have any kind of other construction activity, business or commercial or whatever, of course you have that as well. If you have runoff from a, a parking lot, you're changing the parking lot. You would have some type of um, you know, inspection for that to make sure that you're not increasing the flow of water in those instances. And of course, again, that you're not eroding the actual ground itself. So I, I can't tell you the specifics that occurred for that, a number of inspections, but, um, and, and as you mentioned that, I'm just thinking in my head, what would I have seen in the last month? Well, it's many? just it's just helpful because I mean, obviously, construction. I didn't know if that would be roped into residential inspections or mm -hmm. commercial 21. Just for a separate line item of 52 erosion and sediment control. Mm -hmm. Just that's just it's a it's a high number. And, mm -hmm. and when I lived in the county, you did that all the time. Also, uh, the, they came out and they they looked at everything, um, but just didn't realize there was as many, you know, that was so high in the city. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, I can't help but think with the construction of the VMI pool that there are probably some inspections with, <clears throat> can be repetitive. I, I doubt the city's doing anything related to inspecting anything at VMI. So True. that's just a lot of inspections at s construction in the city, which. Yeah. Lots of good stuff going on. 
Uh, one thing I think that's worth noting is that the uh, special events uh, um, alcohol um, concept, <clears throat> uh, city manager and, and separately myself, and I know Rebecca Logan were all approached by George Uge, who's a, a strong proponent of that. So it's, uh, we're looking at it and collaborating and working with one of our local business owners. Um, if you can think back in your, your memory to the um, um, July 3rd Freedom Food Festival, that would be an event that conceptually the Southern Inn could serve and other uh, within that district, like you were speaking of, uh, Ro or um, the Juniper Lounge, et cetera, would, would be able to participate. So um, glad, glad that we're, the legislature's uh, made that opportunity and look forward to the, the progress there. <clears throat> I know one of the capital improvement pieces was uh, the paving of the skate park. Has that been accomplished? It has not. Our paving operations are delayed until the contractor comes back into the community. Right. Um, I have not asked our public works director when they anticipate that. Typically, it does not occur until they have finished their major projects. And if those run out a little longer, they're a week or two delayed. We want it to come this month because after that, it gets a little too cold to put down asphalt. So I'm really hopeful we'll see them soon. Frankly, the skate park is, a, is something that we are seeing interest in today, but I'm more concerned of a still street, which is a, just a mess there between Washington and, and um, yes. Nelson Street. That's a bad street. I really want to get that paved, but we're at the mercy of the contractor. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Mr. Smith. Um, coincidentally, I've been driving by the skate park to see if there's been any paving progress up there uh, myself. And, and what I, I do see uh, skaters up there, um, Rarely are they wearing uh, safety equipment. I know there's signage up there that um, there's a fine involved if you're not wearing safety equipment, helmets and, and pads. Um, and I'm curious uh, as the level enforcement of, of that um, guideline of that, with, or if, if the, or the requirement of, of the, um, the fine for, for safety equipment, if, if if it's not going to be enforced, is it necessary? Or if it is necessary, what, what's the level of enforcement? And I know, you know, Chief is, is short-staffed and, and it's not going to be a high priority, but I, I want the question put forward as to, um, as the skate park seems to be making progress, um, safety is going to be becoming a, a, a greater issue, um, especially for the for little ones. And I know that falls to the their supervisors, but if they're not there, where um, where are we going to come into um, into play on that? Several good points. I don't have an answer. I'll look at that and get back to you folks. I would uh, observe that in general, most of the um, rules and policies that we have in the city are generally complaint driven. So if they're folks that uh, are identifying it, um, uh, alerting the police or, or making <clears throat> um, that known as you have here tonight uh, would suffice because most of our, that's the way most of our um, enforcement is taking place minus the parking and speeding and other uh, more significant uh, policies. Thank you, uh, Jim. Uh, next, I'd like to call on the city attorney for his report. Uh, just a brief update on the, speaking of the skate park, um, I've been working with VMI's council to come up with a, a memorandum of understanding where we uh, work with VMI cadets, not students, uh, work with VMI cadets to uh, design and build obstacles for the skate park. Um, they wanted the city to take essentially liability concerns to indemnify them, indemnify VMI if anything goes wrong, which we did. Um, I got that back today. Jim signed it earlier tonight. So that's, that's moving forward and um, hopefully that project will, um, I think there's already been some work done. And then we reached the point where they said we're not going to do any more until you guys indemnify us. So um, that's now taken care of. Um, otherwise, don't really have a report. Um, the agenda item we do have under the city attorney is the opioid settlement resolution. Um, this is part of the ongoing process. We, a few months back now, 
you guys authorized um, basically to establish the bucket uh, for money to pour into. Um, tonight's resolution is allowing the city to agree to a settlement to have more money come into that bucket. Um, of the three sort of prongs of the opioid sort of settlement uh, sort of context, there's the distributors, manufacturers, and then the sellers. Uh, we've done sort of the, the largest, the distributors. Uh, we've already approved that settlement. This is a settlement with the manufacturers. Um, and then the sale, se potential settlement with the sellers will be uh, coming up in the next few months. But um, tonight's is to authorize myself and our outside counsel to participate and agree to the settlement uh, with the distributors in the opioid crisis. Um, and then th once that settlement is approved, uh, money will begin to flow into the opioid abatement authority, which then flows into the locality. So um, I certainly recommend approving this resolution tonight. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Jerry. I would ask for council's uh, questions of the city attorney and or your consideration. I have a question. Um, this originated um, several, several years ago and we approved, you know, to go through the process as a result of the adverse impact on a lot of service delivery um, agencies in our area. Will that money, or will we need to decide later uh, what to do with that money when we get it? At the local level, yes. The Opioid Abatement Authority, I believe, is going to set up to essentially cut everybody a check based on a, a formula a model where they've allocated those funds to each individual municipality across the Commonwealth, um, specifically for um, reimbursement for costs associated with epidemic as well as abatement going forward. Um, but to my knowledge, I haven't seen anything where there's been sort of specific recommendations, more specific than those two recommendations at the local level. Um, so that'll be something city staff will sort of be working on once we have uh, a not, you know, some estimate or hopefully certain knowledge of how much money we're going to get um, and then divvy that up into the respective areas. But I, I don't think there's necessarily um, sort of a dollar for dollar, like we've got to account for every cost to, you know, for the money coming in. It's just here's money because, and that's sort of the idea behind that model is no one could come up with that sort of dollar for dollar. So they're just saying, here's, here's what we think your share is. And as long as you either um, compensate for costs that you've incurred generally um, or set up an abatement program, it's, it's up to the municipality to how they want to spend that money. Thank you, Ms. Alexander. I move to approve resolution 2021-11, approving the city's participation in the proposed settlement of opioid-related claims against McKesson, Cardinal Health, Amerisource Bergen, Janssen, and the related corporate entities. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Uh, hearing none, ask for a roll call vote. Mr. Smith? Aye. Mr. Alligood? Aye. Mr. Ayers? Aye. Mr. Sigler? Aye. Ms. Strawn? Aye. Ms. Alexander? Aye. The motion carries unanimously. Thank you all very much, and thank you to Council for uh, sheltering us through this unfortunate um, circumstance with the opioid settlement. Next item on the agenda um, is cons new business, consideration of Lexington Police Department mutual aid agreements, and I call on Chief Green to guide us through this. Welcome, Chief. Good evening, Mayor Friedman, City Council members, City Manager. I am formally requesting City Council's approval for mutual aid agreements to allow for the continual inoperability between our surrounding law enforcement agencies, which will provide for assistance when requested, ensuring the utmost safety of our region. These agreements will allow the partnering agencies to request supplemental staffing, equipment, and resources for a particular event or incident, as well as the ability to share vital law enforcement sensitive information between our departments. An example of how mutual aid agreements allow adjoining police departments to operate safely and efficiently 
can be seen with our prior years and this year's upcoming SCV and CARE parade in January, which will require additional law enforcement support from our surrounding police departments in order to ensure adequate safety, visibility, and deterrence for all individuals involved. Having an updated mutual aid agreement with our neighboring jurisdictions provides a continuous level of information sharing, security, and police presence for our residents, as well as our ability to assist our neighboring jurisdictions when requested. These documents also provide established guidelines and provide safeguards for our responding officers as well as receiving police personnel from multiple police jurisdictions. I thank you for your review and consideration of this matter and I'm available for any questions or concerns regarding this request. Thank you, Chief. Dennis. Uh, Chief Green, just one. I mean, I, I noticed there's mutual aid agreements with the uh, BV and VMI. Do we already have one with Rockbridge County? How does that work? Yes, sir. That was updated when I first got here, probably the first week or so. Again, um, my exuberance, it did not go through our city attorney or city manager at the time, but okay. we do have an existing and updated agreement with our Rockbridge County Sheriff Department. Yeah. And I I'm trying to understand why we have two resolutions for each. Oh, oh, I see. There's the resolution and then there's the agreement. Okay. I, I understand now. Thank you. All right. Yes, sir. Chief Green, yes, were there many revisions to the agreement? There were no revisions. I believe there was an additional paragraph added for the VMI mutual aid agreement for felony sexual assaults involvement and that we would make sure we contact the Commonwealth Attorney's Office within 48 hours of receiving that information. That was the only update. You've heard the <clears throat> Chief's presentation and request and I would ask for Council's consideration. Uh, I'd like to move approval for the resolution Approving a mutual uh, number 2021-12, uh, approving a mutual aid agreement between Lexington Police Department and the VMI Police Department. Would you like okay. the BV1 as well? No, we'll do them independently. Okay. Right. Have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Hearing none, would ask for a roll call vote. Mr. Alligood. Aye. Mr. Ayers. Aye. Ms. Strawn. Aye. Mr. Smith. Aye. Mr. Ziegler. Aye. Ms. Alexander. Aye. I almost called on you first. I wasn't sure if you're going to make it. <laughs> Motion carries unanimously. I'd also ask for your consideration uh, for the uh, mutual aid resolution for Buena Vista. Uh, I'd move to approve resolution 2021-13, um, approving a mutual aid agreement between Lexington Police Department and Buena Vista Police Department. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Uh, hearing none, uh, Mr. Ayers. Aye. Mr. Smith. Aye. Mr. Ziegler. Aye. Ms. Strong. Aye. Mr. Alligood. Aye. Ms. Alexander. Aye. The motion carries unanimously as well. Thank you, Chief, for bringing this to us, and thank you for um, the outreach and cooperation amongst our municipalities and keeping our neighbors safe. Absolutely. Thank you all. Uh, next item is uh, new business consideration of the list of funds to be reserved or carried over from fiscal year 2021. Uh, Jen, step right up. Hello. Thank you again. So the document provided lists those amounts that we would like to request be reserved from fund balance at the end of FY21. Um, if approved by city council, City Council, the annual comprehensive financial report will reflect the amounts as committed fund balance. And this will allow the city to reserve funds that are needed to complete projects or activities for the city that were either started in FY21 or had planned to have been started in FY21. So you will note that um, this amount may be higher than what we've seen in years past. And that is due to the ARPA funding that the city received in June of 2021 to the amount of 
five million dollars. And so we're requesting this full amount be carried forward to FY22 since we were not able to spend it in just a few days. Um, one other note I'd like to point out is um, you see the, the 1.5 million in, listed as the budget surplus from FY21. And I just want to point out this does include the $800,000 that was approved at the last council meeting to be placed into the equipment replacement fund for the new ladder truck. Um, the additional $741,000 um, we recommend be withheld from fund balance and moved over to FY22. From there, we've discussed um, $500,000 going into capital projects with the remaining $241,000 being set aside for anything that should pop up during the year. So I expect next week to come before you with a public hearing and an ordinance to approve that $800,000 and the $500,000. But for tonight, um, I'm just requesting that you give us the permission to go ahead and move the carryover amounts. Thanks, Jennifer. You've heard the finance director's uh, review and recommendation and welcome council's consideration. I move to approve carrying over from FY 2021 to FY 22, the amounts shown in our packet. Second. Have a motion. Thank you, Mr. Chairs, for the second. Any discussion? There's a lot of dollars uh, rolling forward and I uh, look forward to their allocation. Uh, would ask for a roll call vote. Uh, Ms. Strawn? Aye. Mr. Sigler? Aye. Mr. Alligood? Aye. Mr. Ayers? Aye. Mr. Smith? Aye. Ms. Alexander? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next item for uh, consideration is uh, a request from Hull's Drive-In. I'll call on the city manager. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, this is a pretty straightforward issue. I, we're all familiar with it. Hull's is going to buy or has purchased the land that it sits on, so it will be with us for many decades. Uh, they have met their public fundraising uh, goal, but they still have other associated costs, and I've spoken with the co-chair, Mr. Paxton, about this, and he would certainly like to see us participate like Rockbridge County, Rockbridge County has not acted, but I am assured that what they will do is provide a tax break, uh, ongoing tax break for the Hull's uh, 501c3. Um, so being part of a greater community, it's a small amount, $5,000, much less than requested. And I believe that it would be very um, helpful for the city to be a participant here with our other community partners and provide a small amount for the one time uh, ask, if you will, and opportunity to make sure that we have halls with us for, again, many decades to come. So I'm recommending that um, with the new revenues we're seeing in our budget and other carryover, we have funds to take care of this small amount and ask for your approval, please. For the sake of discussion, I move to uh, make a one time contribution of $5,000 to support the purchase of property for halls drive them. A second. I have a motion and a second. Uh, discussion? Mr. Smith. Uh, well, <clears throat> well, I agree with everything our city manager said. I would prefer tabling this until um, we get, until I get uh, some better guidance on how uh, future uh, appropriations of one-time asks um, will, be, will be made. Uh, my, my concern is unintended consequences of uh, a gift to Hull's Drive-In, which from where I sit opens the door for uh, how many ever uh, upcoming one-time asks. And I need some guidance or some criteria on which to approve or not approve one-time asks um, of, of this nature. Um, it's going to be very difficult to say yes to some and no to others if 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 I don't have some guidance on on how and why we are we are spending money, especially when I'm looking at. Um, granted, yes, we do have a, a pretty healthy carryover, but when I'm looking down the road, as Mr. Sigler often reminds us, the costs that are are coming at us and how we're going to afford them, um, and 
I agree Halls is a great asset to this community. What they do for tourism and, and revenue generation I think is extremely important. Um, however, um, I'm, I'm still hesitant to approve um, uh, $5,000, whatever the amount is, um, until either the city council comes up with some guidance on how and why these monies will be spent or the city manager comes up with some guidance on how um, this, this, this will, will go forward. With, with the asks that come in through your office, how you come up with recommendations to city council. So I know we're all on the same page as, as we move forward. Um, that, that's really all I have. So it, my ask is, is to delay this till our next meeting till I have some better ideas on how we're gonna deal with future asks of this nature. Thank you. Does anyone on council have an objection to uh, de delaying the vote? I'd like to continue the discussion, but I'd like to address Mr. Smith's request. Was the request just till the next meeting? When did you set a time? I, I, I did not set a time. I guess the nature of this request is not, it, there's not a sense of urgency to it. So I guess I would rely either on council or city manager's direction on the best way to move forward to, to answer this request i would say if there's not a, a recommendation would be to uh, table it to our next meeting and we'll see if we have information sufficient and we can continue to table it until uh, but plan to have it at our next meeting i would think the city manager can deliver information or, or council can come up that's fine with direction if there's no objection i don't want to Everybody's okay with that. I, I would welcome council's uh, continued conversation in response uh, that you may have to Mr. Smith. Um, I, I would just say that um, with this particular request, I, 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 speaking for myself, I, I, I would feel comfortable with this request and w would approve it. But I, I do understand uh, uh, Councilman Smith's point about possibly having some guidelines so we know why we're saying yes to this and, and no to something else. Like for, for this one, it's very important that it brings in tourism dollars to our community. And also it's a one-time only request. And also it has broad support from our regional partners, which is very important. And I, I, would, I, I would stress that if, 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 we don't, if we don't make our contribution to some of these regional projects, it actually has a chilling effect on the other regional partners making contributions to it. So I do feel that we need to carry our fair share of regional projects. So for all of those reasons, you know, that's why I would feel that Hall's Drive-In, this request is, is to me a suitable request for us to contribute to, but I understand Councilman Smith's point, and if, if we want to wait until our next meeting and maybe come up with some more formal guidelines, I'm okay with that too. And I, I would just add that it's going to be, um, be helpful to always have discussions about how we will approach and, and treat one-time requests, but we, that's our job to accept one-time requests or, or multi-year you know, requests. and. Um, we will always have to take them on their merits, whether we say yes or we say no. I think it's really good, though, that we're we're stopping and thinking about this one. I think, I mean, it's, it always is helpful that you, as I like to say, take a little bit more time, that we're all sure of our vote. We think about the long term, uh, you know, does it, does it help? Does it hinder? Uh, because that's the last thing we ever want to do is to hinder regional cooperation. Um, but you know, it's just the it's just the weight of being on city council. We would never want to say our policy is we will not listen to or accept one time requests. I would hope that we always have folks come and tell us what what's going on, what might be needed, and then that's our hard job. Uh, and we either put it into the budget the next year, or we are in a position to act on something now, or we say no. Um, so I, it's always healthy, and I'm glad that we're tabling it, and we can all, again, think about this and, and think about the greater, uh, the greater community in, in Rockbridge County and our taxpayer dollars in the city. I hope that uh, in further discussion and in making some um, plans for how to move forward with these special requests, 
that we consider how we're going to strike a balance between those agencies who request help every year because they work with the most vulnerable in our community. And balancing that, those needs with those requests that are based on entertainment or things like that, that that are beneficial to our community as well. But I think that there needs to be a balancing act with that and, and making sure that those agencies out there that are really suffering um, get some assistance from us and, and we pay attention to that as well as paying attention to those that are enhancing our economy. I have no problem with tabling it. I'm just not sure if we're giving very clear instructions to the city manager or if it's really, if, if this means we need to have a work session to work through it ourselves. So I guess I'm just looking for direction. Jim, do you, do you feel like you have direction to make an additional recommendation at, at the next meeting? Because you do kind of, you do explain your reasoning for this one. Yes, I believe I've heard what council is asking for and I can provide some, I think, criteria where you can evaluate particular um, ask, if you will, or request, so that it seems, um, again, more uh, transparent to the public why a decision might be made, uh, even though I, and I agree with Mr. Ziegler that, uh, you know, you can look at any number of factors or uh, uh, tend to uh, it, it not take those in attributes or factors into a, a case by case basis as you make decisions. You can you can do whatever you want. So it's a tough job. It's your job. So, but it will help to have some guidelines, and I'll do that. And I'm I'm always lost at this point. If I table my motion, or I think we've just agreed to table okay. it, <clears throat> um, suspending a little bit of Robert's rules, and um, just friendly will uh, uh, kick it to the next meeting. And keep it on the agenda. Uh, it's unfinished business. Any other comments or observations? Mr. Smith. Um, at our last um, inter-jurisdictional meeting, you heard um, some folks from Rockbridge Outdoors uh, describe the programming. So it's more, of less, more or less an extension of the, the tourism office. <clears throat> and one of the uh, results that came out of the leadership meeting yesterday was from Steve Reeser, who's with the uh, DWR. Um, formerly known as DGIF, about a new uh, Maury River float guide uh, that provides mileage and uh, descriptions of different parts of the Maury from uh, Rockbridge Baths down to the confluence of, uh, uh, with the James. So I wanted to hand those out to council as I said I would for you all to, to use as a resource when and if you all get uh, on the river. And you notice at the bottom it says Maury River float guide. Um, I think, I hope that the correct version is, uh, that's available on the DWR site um, <laughs> will not reflect uh, that typo. So it's, a, it's, a, it's one of the, I guess, first great products that's come out of Rockbridge Outdoors and uh, I'm really excited to share it with you all as, um, as we start to promote recreation in, in Rockbridge County to, to boost uh, our economy. Thank you. Thank you, Chuck. Um, <clears throat> next item on the agenda is a closed meeting, and before uh, Ms. Alexander reads this in, just wanted to uh, acknowledge that we do not plan on taking any action after this, and um, after she reads this in, we'll uh, break down the equipment and then uh, step into closed session. So, Ms. Alexander, if you can read us into closed session, please. I'll try. I move that Lexington City Council will convene and close meeting in accordance with Section 2.2-3711, Subsection A, Paragraph 8 of the Code of Virginia, a closed session for the purpose of consultation with legal counsel regarding specific legal matters requiring the provision of legal, legal advice. Second. Thank you for your second. Um, we'll have roll call. Uh, Ms. Strawn? Aye. Mr. Smith? Aye. Mr. Sigler? Aye. Mr. Ayers? Aye. Mr. Alligood? Aye. And I vote aye. We shall move into closed meeting. Thank you. Oh.
much as you want. I agree with your point about <laughs> entertainment value versus community service. So <laughs> folks in need, they have greater needs. It's, I'm wrestling with it morally. You know, when I know about various agencies that are struggling every month to meet payroll and trying to still provide services in the community, that's a tough one. That's right. Yeah. Well, we, we spend money for entertainment at city pool. It's one of our city services. That. But that's, that's, that's right. But, yeah. but the, the driving theater is different. Yeah. It's in the county. It was private, now it's a, a non profit. That's right. Um, I can see the, the need for community participation.